What is the Curse of Cain Doctrine? The Curse of Cain Doctrine, which was an official doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from 1848 to 2013 when it was repudiated, said that Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, killed Abel in a dispute. So, God changed Cain from a white man into the first Negro. Cain married his sister, and she became the second Negro. Ham, the son of Noah, married Egyptus, a Negro woman already pregnant with a Negro child, and that is why Negroes survived the Great Flood. Mormon leaders taught that Negroes, their term for black Africans, would only go to the celestial kingdom as eternal servants of faithful Mormons. Mormon leaders taught that Negroes were not only cursed with a black skin, flat nose, and kinky hair, but were also an inferior race. Joseph Fielding Smith was the 10th president of the Mormon Church and a top Mormon leader at the time Mitt Romney served as a Mormon missionary. This is what he wrote about black people. Not only was Cain called upon to suffer, but because of his wickedness he became the father of an inferior race. A curse was placed upon him, and that curse has been continued through his lineage and must do so while time endures. Millions of souls have come into this world cursed with a black skin and have been denied the privilege of priesthood and the fullness of the blessings of the gospel. These are the descendants of Cain. Moreover, they have been made to feel their inferiority and have been separated from the rest of mankind from the beginning. We will also hope that the blessings may eventually be given to our Negro brethren, for they are our brethren, children of God, notwithstanding their black covering emblematical of eternal darkness. The church is now saying that the curse of Cain doctrine was never a doctrine of the church, just some speculation by some of the members. This is what they tell journalists, non-Mormons, and the younger Mormons who were born after the church stopped teaching the curse of Cain doctrine. They don't know Mormon history regarding the curse of Cain doctrine. It is kept from them. The church is telling a big lie when they tell non-Mormons and young Mormons that the curse of Cain was never doctrine but just some speculation by some church members. The curse of Cain doctrine was called a doctrine of the church in official letters signed by the First Presidency in 1949 and 1951. It was not some speculation by a few members. It was preached by Mormon leaders in general conference in official church publications such as the Millennial Star, Journal of Discourses, and the Improvement Era magazine, all official Mormon publications. It was believed by 90% of white Mormons until the 1970s when the church, because of PR reasons, stopped openly preaching it. The Curse of Cain doctrine was disavowed only in 2013, not by the First Presidency, but by the LDS Public Affairs Department. Church leaders believe in something called lying for the Lord, which means that if you lie for the good of the church to make the church more popular with the world, then you are doing good. LDS Church Public Affairs has lied a lot. From 1996 to 2013, LDS Public Affairs told non-Mormons and journalists that the church never taught that blacks were cursed, nor were they the descendants of Cain. That, too, was another big lie. Also, church leaders are anointed Mormons, and they believe they can commit any sin except shedding innocent blood or leaving Mormonism and still become gods for all eternity. They have been sealed to godhood in a super-secret ritual in the Salt Lake Mormon Temple. The church is deliberately lying about the Curse of Cain doctrine. It is lying to the public, and it is lying to younger Mormons who don't know any better.
Hello, good evening. This is Zach of Verdict Productions. With me is Derek Evenson. Derek is a former Mormon missionary and apologist. He is the author of The Gainsayers, a book which sold in Mormon bookstores for 10 years. We are here tonight to discuss Mormonism and the curse of Cain, or in other words, how the Mormon church taught for 130 years that black people were the cursed children of Cain and why that church banned blacks from its priesthood and temples for 130 years. So Derek, let's begin. Um, please tell me a little about your background in the Mormon church. Okay, Zach, uh, I grew up in Santa Monica, California, and uh, I was did not grow up as a Mormon. I, I, did, I didn't have any religion growing up. Um, I lived not too far from the LA Temple, which is in West Los Angeles, and I was all it's up on a hill, and they, they they throw you know lights on it at night. It looks like a big golden temple. So uh, I was always curious about it as as a youth. So I used to go visit the uh, L.A. Temple Visitor Center a number of times when I was uh, in the sixth, seventh grade, eighth grade. And uh, I later joined the Marine Corps Reserve, even though I didn't stay there in the Marines. I didn't uh, for various reasons. But um, I met a Mormon uh, who bunked next to me, and he invited me to Mormon services, and the missionaries taught me. And I I'd read very positive things about the Mormons in, in Reader, Reader's Digest articles, which I later found out were actually advertisements paid for by uh, the LD Church, LDS Church's Public Affairs Department. But I read how the Mormons didn't smoke or drink, and neither did I. In fact, I was allergic to nicotine, and my parents were chain smokers. And uh, how the, the articles in Reader's Digest said how moral and honest Mormons were. And so that they, they uh, something attracted me to the Mormon Church. And when the opportunity came to join when I was 18 years old, I did. So I joined the Mormon Church when I was 18. I uh, was active for about... Uh, three years and I was went on a mission to the California San Jose mission which at that, that time included San Jose California and San Francisco and all this all the communities in between there and uh, I served honorable mission um, there, we had a lot of uh, anti-mormon um, problems a lot of anti-mormon propaganda down in the mission at that time uh -huh. a lot of a lot of, uh, of the missionaries are losing investigators because of anti Mormon propaganda. So when I came home, especially the a film called The Godmakers uh, by Ed Decker, Saints Alive in Jesus, called The Godmakers. So when I came home, I uh, wanted to uh, write a book defending the church against anti Mormon attacks, specifically those found in The Godmakers film and book. There's also a book called The Gunmakers by Ed Decker and Dave Hunt. And uh, so I wrote, well, I came back and I, and I wrote a book called The Gainsayers. A gainsayer is an old English word. It means one who opposes the truth, a gainsayer. And I wrote that book and I sent it off to LDS publishers and they all rejected it because they said that the brethren didn't want people asking questions, you know, about anti-Mormon things. Oh. Basically, the church didn't want people to be discussing that sort of thing. Okay. So, But that book was later published. Three years after I wrote it, it was published. But um, So I was kind of disappointed in that. But it, was, and, it, it wasn't published by the church? It was published by somebody else? Yeah, it was published by Horizon Publishers, which was a small <laughs> LDS publisher out of Bountiful, Utah. But uh, yeah, I sent the manuscript to Deseret Book and Bookcraft. I sent it to all the the LDS publishers, um, including Deseret Book, which was owned by the church, and they all rejected it in 1985. They all rejected it. Uh, the few that told me why they rejected it was that the church didn't want people thinking about those things. Okay. They didn't. The church leaders didn't want the members even thinking about anti-Mormon material. Okay. And so my book, The Gainsayers, you know, was not anti-Mormon. It was pro-Mormon. It was written in response in, in, to defend the church against anti-Mormon material. But the attitude of 
of the church at the time in 1985 was we didn't want, you know, they didn't even want members thinking about those things, even right. though my book defended the church. Yeah, just so that's com- what I was, completely that's what out, I was of, out of sight, out of mind type thing there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Kind of, you know, like, you know, a big brother, you know, was watching you and uh, yeah. it was, you know, thought control, that kind of thing. Yep. So, um, anyway, I wrote that book, but um, I knew it was ultimately, I think it was a good book. It was later published and, and sold in all these book bookstores for 10 years. I sold the copyright to the book to someone else for $400 so I could fix my car, the brakes oh, wow. in my car. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I didn't have 400 bucks on me. So. so, after that, the book was not mine. But it was published, and someone else got the royalties for it, which which is fine. And it's like I say, it sold. And that book was an answer to the Godmakers film and book, which was by Ed Decker, A Sense Alive in Jesus. And uh, Ed Decker, um, he's still alive, but he's very old right now. But he was very popular in the 1970s and 1980s as an anti-Mormon author and lecturer. And uh, his film, The Godmakers. Uh, was seen by over 12 million people and uh, wow. so he did a lot of, yeah he did the church a lot of damage with that with with his film and his books so um, and he was not I gotta be honest he's just not a very honest man so he he even though in the Godmakers film I would say was probably 80% accurate and his book the Godmakers probably 90% accurate Yet he t- he told some really big lies that that would anger uh, evangelicals a lot. Got very angry at us because they the Godmakers book and film said that Mormons really worship Joseph Smith as their savior, not Jesus. Okay. And that yeah, and that Mormons Mormons uh, are lie to Christians by saying that we believe in Jesus Christ. But we, as our savior, but we and we don't. We really believe Joseph Smith is our savior, and that he paid for our sins in Carthage jail. You know, really? which is a big lie. <laughs> yeah, definitely, us. definitely, big yeah. lie. So, because of that lie, that big lie, and a few other big lies in the film and the book, many evangelicals were very angry at us because they thought we were lying to them, and we weren't. We were sincere, of course. You, know, you don't sacrifice two years of your life, you know, and not get paid for it. Right. Uh, be, you know, and not get any material gain to tell a lie. You don't do that. Right. And that makes we a lot of sense. Be. That makes a lot of sense to me why I've heard certain things that I've heard, uh, you know, just random people and what they believe about the Mormon church. And I'm thinking to myself, well, this is way off from the truth. Why do people think these things, you know? And maybe it's from yeah. the, this time period of the, the God Makers film and book being created, you know? That has a lot to do with it because Ed Decker really put out a lot of misinformation. Um, probably it was one of his biggest lies which I heard told which was night, late 1979 in the Fern Hill Branch Library in Tacoma, Washington he was giving a lecture anti-Mormon lecture, there was a lot of people there and uh, he was claiming that Mormons store two years of uh, food, guns and ammunition huh. in, or, in order to when the prop, Mormon prophet says go Mormons are going to leap out from their homes, kill all the Christians on the block. <laughs> uh, Mormons in the military, we're going to take over the military. Mormons in the CIA, we're going to take over the CIA. Mormons in the FBI, we're going to take over the FBI. Yeah. And take over the country. And when that happens, the, the Mormon prophet, at that time, Special David Kimball, was going to get in, into a plane from Salt Lake City, fly to the airport in Washington, D.C., get out be taken by limousine to the Washington DC Mormon temple where there is an exact replica of the oval office (laughs) and he was going to go to the oval office and reign as dictator over America from the oval office. And that was the Mormon plan. And every Mormon knew that plan and all these people around me jumped up and started clapping 
They believed every word he said. Wow. I'm not even kidding you. So yes, uh, Decker did a lot of damage uh, as far as putting a lot of misinformation out there uh, about uh, Mormons and the church. And so that's one major reason I wrote the Gainsayers. But after I wrote the Gainsayers, uh, I couldn't, no Mormon publisher would publish it at the time. Because again, the attitude was the brethren don't want more members thinking about this. Right. Even even if it's defense of the faith, we don't want them thinking about this. Yeah. So I was disappointed, but I thought, okay, I got um, in. I thought to myself two things. Number one, I you know someone needs to do research to write a book. I was planning to do a book, a big thick book, a thousand pages, called the Book of Answers to anti-Mormon questions and that would have all pro-Mormon answers to all anti-Mormon questions and and I was hoping to find some Mormon who would publish that for me like uh, with Bible paper you know really thin paper yeah so that you know so that could, it could be sold cheaply and that and so that members could 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 send it to missionaries because missionaries were losing investigators left and right because of anti war propaganda. So that was my goal. 90% that was my thought pattern. 10% my thought pattern was I wanted to find out if these, these claims were true or not myself. I, I was expecting and hoping that I could refute all anti Mormon arguments just with research. Okay. That, that was my expectation, my hope, but ten, in the back of my mind, you know, I was a closet doubter. I was going, gee, maybe maybe some of these things are true after all, and I want to find out. Uh-huh. So that's that was my thought pattern. I was, I, you know, I was ninety percent. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna defend the church and write this book, and the missionaries are gonna have this book on their missions, and they're not gonna be losing sincere investigators to animal more propaganda anymore. And then all, all over on the on the other hand, ten percent. I was thinking, well, I want to know myself. I want to know if this. What's going on here? Is you know I want to know myself if these things are true or not. Right. So anyway, I went and kind of a, I became obsessed with it. I probably have obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and I became obsessed with this project, the Book of Answers project. So I dropped everything. You know, dropped out of school, dropped, which was foolish, I now see, but I dropped everything. And I decided I need to do this. And so in order to to study Mormon history and, and the anti-Mormons were quoting all these old, obscure books. And, you know, that published in the 1800s or early 19th century. I didn't have access to these books. I didn't have access to the information I needed. And the only places where place where I could get access was Utah. I had to go to, so I moved to Utah, and uh, I started uh, doing intensive research. And um, I just did intensive research uh, at Brigham Young University Special Collections, Marriott Library, University of Utah Special Collections, Utah State. Uh, Historical Society, uh, Salt Lake City Library, which has a very large selection, of course, on on Mormon selection and anti-Mormon selection. I just did did tons and tons and tons of research, tens of thousands. For I did that for two years, just tens of thousands of hours of research, and uh, I, one by one, I came to see that even though there there were there were there was unreliable anti-Mormon propaganda out there that did tell lies or exaggerations. Um, I began to, to discover that most, the great majority of anti-Mormon claims are true. Really? That, you know, just by doing my research. I'll give you an example, Adam God doctrine. Uh, Anti-Mormons say Brigham Young taught that Adam was the father of Jesus Christ and the father of our spirits. And, uh, you know, that Adam came down and begot Jesus with Mary in the same way a man begets with a woman. And so uh, 
the, the Mormon church's response to that at the time was, no, Brigham Young was misquoted. He never taught that. Well, I did a lot of tons of research, and there's a lot of material out there. And I found out, yes, everything the anti Mormon said about Adam God doctrine is the truth. Brigham Young did teach it. He taught it in general conference. He taught, he, there was a lecture at the Vale at the St. George Temple, which was the only working temple during the life of Brigham Young, which had a lecture on the Adam God. Huh. Before you went through, the, went through the veil of the temple during the Mormon endowment ceremony, so that so just one after another, con- confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. I, I went there to to find evidence to refute anti-Mormon claims, and time again and again and again and again and again. But after I'd done hundreds and hundreds of hours of research, looking at all sorts of things, I, I discovered that most most of the anti-Mormon claims were true. So, you know, this this was very devastating for me. Um, I had a, a, a faith crisis. What's that, what it's called now? Right. Um, during this time, I, you know, I talked to various people. Um, one, one clincher was when I, uh, when I discovered that Joseph Smith had, quote unquote, married the wives of of men he had sent to England on missions. He would he would come to them and said, "The Lord has told me that uh, you're to be my spiritual wife," you know, and and an angel with a flaming sword. God sent an angel with a flaming sword and said, "The angel said he would destroy me if I didn't take additional wives, and and you're to be my wife." And wow. if, the, if the women objected. And some of them did. Joseph Smith would say, uh, "Well, if you, you know, if you, if you, be, the Lord has told me if you become my spiritual wife, you know, and you can't tell your husband, you can't tell anyone. It's a, it's our secret between you, me, and the Lord. Uh, if you become my spiritual wife, uh, you and your husband and your children and all your future children and your your." Your, your parents and, and all your parents, other children will be exalted in the celestial kingdom forever. But if you deny this and you, you go against God and his commandment here, you know, then you're going to be damned and God's going to destroy you. Yeah. That's what he told them. So that's the choice they had. Wow. Now, that's, yeah. So Joseph Smith was married to, uh, he, Joseph Smith had 34 wives. Uh, 33 besides Emma. Oh, wow. And 11 of his, his wives were married to other men who didn't know that Joseph Smith had married their wives. <laughs> and Joseph Smith would go and visit them from time to time when their husbands were away, either on missions or on business or whatever. And uh, he would have sex with them and he would tell them again, you know, don't tell anyone. This is our secret. If you tell... If you tell a soul, soul any that this is happening, God's gonna send that angel with a flaming sword and destroy you. So when I found that out, when I found out that was the truth, and that is the truth, that is historical, I started calling up. I I was just devastated, so I started calling up uh, church historians, and I'd say, "Is this true?" And they would say, "I can't talk about it." <laughs> Click and. I can okay. start getting dial, dial tones. So I, I, I would call the church. I would call the church historical department. Is this true? And I, I talked to different people. Some of them would say, yeah, it's true. Others would hang up on me. Others would say, well, you know, I can't talk about it. Wow. So, yeah, this is what I'm going through. And, and this really perturbed me. So I would start, I started calling up the church office of the first pregnancy because I wanted to just confirm that this was the truth, you know, or not. And so, uh, I would, I was kind of put off. They said, we'll talk to your Bishop. I said, I did. My Bishop doesn't know anything. Well, then just go with that. <laughs> wow. I said, or they would say, well, why are you asking questions? I said, because I want to know answers. That's usually why people ask questions. And then I hear the click, and 
another dial tone. Yeah. So yeah. So finally, I wrote. I would write letters and I'd call in. And finally, I had a uh, a, a man who used to be a BYU religion professor who now worked in Salt Lake City at church office building by the name of Roy Doxey. And he used to be a religion professor at BYU for many years. And at the, this time, he was working in the office of the First Presidency, I guess dealing with, he had some secret task of dealing with people, Mormons involved with polygamy or something. But of course, so they figured they'd let him handle me, even though I wasn't a polygamist, didn't want to be a polygamist, but I had a, like, a polygamy, polygamy related question. So, so it was basically, hey, this guy won't stop calling us. You take care of him, Roy. So he said, all right. So he said, Brother Jameson, uh, how may I help you? I said, yeah, I, I, I just, I found out that Je- Joseph Smith had 11 wives that were the husbands of other men. And he, he told these women not to tell anyone or an angel with a flaming sword would, would destroy them. And that if, if they were his wives, that their entire extended families would be exalted. But if they denied him, that they would be destroyed by God. They'd basically killed and go and go to hell. Is you know this is what I've this is my what my researchers have uncovered. Uh, is this true? And he said yes. Wow. And I was just in. I mean, shock. Of course. Almost had, a, almost had an out of body experience. You yeah. Because I had written a book defending Joseph Smith, and I defended him in front of all sorts of people for years and I said well I said well I mean I, I said I, I I can't believe it and he said why can't you believe it and I said well I can't believe that Joe Smith would do such a thing he says why can't you believe Joe Smith would do such a thing I said well that's that's not right he says why isn't it right <laughs> I, I said, well, it doesn't sound right to me. And he, he said, I'll paraphrase him. He said, Brother Evenson, you know, we don't judge the things of God. We are judged by the things of God. You know, Joseph Smith, the prophet Joseph Smith, was commanded of the Lord to do this. He said, and we are not. Now, if we did this, we would be condemned for it. Oh, yeah. But, not Joseph Smith because he was the prophet of the Lord so he was not condemned and this is what he told me he said he said Joseph Smith could lie he could he could take the, the wives of other men he could he could he could he could marry his own foster daughters which he did he could he could marry mothers and their own daughters which he did he could murder others that he said, and that was not a sin because he had the authority from God to do those things. This is what he's telling me, Zach. Yeah. yeah. I am in shock. And my my mouth is open. My eyes are bulging on the, on the phone. You know, I'm shaking all over like a leaf listening to this guy, Roy Doxey, who at the office of the First Presidency, telling me all this stuff. Can you imagine how I felt? I had a strong testimony of the church and Joseph Smith, and I'm finding out all these things. And I said, I said, Brother Doxy, I can't accept that. I can't accept that. He says, well, you're going to have to accept it. I said, well, I can't accept that. He says, well, you're going to have to accept it. I, I said, oh, my God. And uh, I asked him a couple other questions and uh, asked him a question about Adam God. And he confirmed to me, yes, Brim Young taught that Adam was God. And I, and I said, but I said, but the living prophet today says that the Adam God doctrine is false. How can a true prophet like Brim Young teach a false doctrine what the church churches today teaches is false? I said, that's a contradiction. And he says, no, 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 there's no contradiction. I said, there isn't? He goes, no. And he, this is how he explained this to me. When Brigham Young was the living prophet, Adam was God the Father. 
and that was the truth. And he was the father of our spirits and, our, and the father of the spirit and body of Jesus. But as soon as Brimion died, that was no longer true. Now it's false because a new living prophet has come along and says it's, pro it's, it's false. He says, whatever the living prophet says is true, even if that contradicts a dead prophet. Interesting. That's, yeah, that's... <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God. Yeah, of course. I, I, Why, I, I thought, uh, oh my God, I, I was in shock. I, I think I just, I said thank you, and I slowly hung up the phone I, Zach I think I just walked in my room and fell on my bed I was in shock after that can you imagine no yeah I mean I, I can try to imagine but no I yeah I that's... mean for, for someone who had a, such a strong testimony as I did you know and, for, and who did, wrote a book defending Joseph Smith yeah and, and, <laughs> and defended, defended Mormonism Joseph Smith the people uh, this, this was just this was like I'll give you an example. This was like, you know, you grow up in a house with your parents love you and you grow up and then you think your parents are good people and then you, then you find out your parents are like mass murderers who are on the run. Yeah. yeah and they're also cannibals and they raise children and, the, and then they kill them and eat them, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, the, and, and then you, you run out of your room when you find this out and you say, Mommy, Daddy, are you? I, I, you know, someone Billy said your your cannibals on the run, and they and they they take out their knives, and they said that's right, and we're going to kill you right now. That's you know they're chasing you around the room. They, I you, I wouldn't have been more shocked, you know, by that. <clears throat> that's how shocked I was yeah. when I when I found all this stuff out. So I mean I mean just I was completely absolutely devastated. Anyway, after finding that out. I, you know, you might say lost my testimony, and I, tr I tried for another um, few years to regain my testimony in some way. I, I came, I started thinking Joseph Smith might have been a fallen prophet. You know, like I, I began to compare him with, with uh, like David out of the Bible. You know, who, who, who murdered Uriah's wife and committed adultery and all that kind of stuff. So I, I tried to hang on to, to some form of testimony but the more the more i studied and researched uh that started to fall as well i the more i studied about the book of mormon archaeology uh the book of abraham and egyptology uh the kinderhook plates uh which the just smith said he translated a portion of which were fakes which he couldn't have translated any portion of it so i you know i it just began to fall then you know, I, it just, the cards came down until finally in, and I, I had some other bad experiences when, uh, with, with a, a Mormon roommate that I had, uh, when I was going to the young adult ward in the Bellevue, Washington, uh, I told you that story. And, uh, so you, anyone listening there, if you want to hear that story, um, we have another video called a Mormon sex scandals and cover-ups and you, you look for that on YouTube and, and uh, you can hear about that story so uh, basically Zach I just uh, lost my faith and I resigned I went inactive in late 1989 and I finally resigned from the church in 1994 and that's my background I am now an ex-Mormon and I uh, that's where I came from. I was once a very, very good Mormon, very believing Mormon. Now uh, a Mormon apologist defending the church. Now I'm an ex-Mormon. Now I do YouTube videos exposing the church with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, we, I, I myself was also in the same position as you were, as a strong believing um, member of the LDS church. With the testimony and Joseph Smith and everything, and you know, I I didn't uh, fall away in the same manner that you did, but uh, you know, I did some research on my own and 
had some my opening experiences of my own and uh, just found this path you know and I'm I'm glad to have been able to to meet you and been able to work on these projects with you so um, yeah I, I appreciate I, I really do I, <laughs> I appreciate all the information that you've brought to the table and you know the, the the work you're trying to do now to to open further open people's minds and their eyes you know because if you don't have an open mind about this this specific topic of you know the Mormon Church then you're just going to be blindly following like you always like I, I like I was like you were until you started questioning things you know yeah and yeah. The, the, the reason we're doing this interview tonight is because I wanted to ask you some further questions about one of the more controversial topics in the Mormon Church's history which is the curse of Cain doctrine you know which yeah. is uh, which is um, a topic that a lot of people are still interested in today even though it's been uh, it's been almost 40 years since uh, since the blacks were allowed to start holding the priesthood. So why don't you tell us a, a brief history of the Curse of Cain doctrine and why it was taught in the church? Okay, just very, very briefly, um, Joseph Smith uh, uh, allowed black people in, into the early Mormon church as equals, and uh, he ordained uh, his his stepbrother, who was, who was part black, Elijah Abels, to the priesthood. He, he uh, invited black people into the Nauvoo temple when it was finished, even though he died before it was finished. So Joseph Smith uh, also once ran for president in the United States, where he advocated that blacks be set free, educated, and given equal rights. So oh, Joseph Smith uh, was not a, a racist. Okay. He was he had enlightened views re regarding blacks, and uh, he let black people join the Mormon church. Uh, as equals, and black men in the early Mormon church were ordained to the priesthood just like every other man. And in the Mormon church, every male over the age of 12 holds the priesthood. And the, and for a for Mormon man to go to the Mormon temple, you have to have the priesthood. Right. So it's, uh, you know, and to have any leadership in the church at all, you ha also have to have the priesthood. So every Mormon male uh, uh, above the the age of 12 is a priesthood holder. You have the priesthood, and then you have priesthood leaders, which actually have leader leadership positions in the priesthood. So uh, early early black Mormons were priesthood holders, and some of them were also priesthood leaders. And there wasn't a problem with that. The Mormon church was originally very progressive on the race issue. Um, however, uh, Joseph Smith sent missionaries, at, uh, his apostles as missionaries to England in the 1840s, uh, they found they had a lot of success with a certain sect of British people called the uh, followers of Joanna Southcott. Southcott. Now, Joanna Southcott claimed to be a prophetess, and she died in 1804, but she had a lot of followers in England at one time. And in the 1840s, she still had thousands of followers. The Southcottites. So jo Joanna Southcott claimed to be a prophetess, and she even produced books of Revelation, which were her poems, long poems that would go on for hundreds and hundreds of verses. And in her Revelations, Joanna Southcott um, claimed that um, Negroes were fallen angels, and that the, in the war, there was a war in heaven, and that uh, the angels of God Two thirds of the angels fought against Lucifer or the red dragon, and a one third of the angels followed uh, Lucifer, and that that, that these these one third of angels were cast down to earth and became the Negro race. And she said were or de, were the descendants of Cain, because okay. in Europe at the time, uh, some people, a lot of people, believe that that black people were the descendants of Cain through Ham. That that theory began in the in the Babylonian Talmud, which was written about 400 A.D. Uh -huh. by a Jewish scribe who was trying to to 
to explain why there were different races of mankind. So he concluded that the black race came from Cain, that that Cain was a white man. God put a mark on him, changing him into the first Negro, and uh, and that the race of Cain survived through the flood because Ham, the son of Noah, married a already pregnant Negro woman who was of the, of the seed of Cain. So that that was you can find that in the Babylonian Talmud, which was written about 400 to 600 A.D. in by Jewish a Jewish scribe living in Iraq about 600 A.D. Okay. A Talmud Talmud is a, a commentary, basically a commentary on the the Torah, which is the five books of Moses. So anyway, that's how that theory started. The, the Cain, Ham, Negro theory, and that that became popular in Europe, also in England in the 1700s. Jo- Joanna Southcott, who, who was never a Mormon, the Mormon Church didn't start the 1830. Joanna Southcott in the, in the 1790s claimed to be a prophetess, uh, published books of Revelation, in which she said that uh, the Negroes were the children of Cain. And that they were they were being punished with slavery and, and all that because they were they were those fallen angels. So that's where that doctrine came from. And so when the Mormon apostles went to England, they they found all these South Southcottites who who responded well to the Mormon message. The Mormon message was, "Hey, we have a living prophet." And the Southcottites said, "Hey, we have a living prophet." We had a living prophetess, but she died in 1804. Okay. And the Mormons say, and the Mormons say, oh no, we have a well, that's nice, but we have a living prophet who's alive right now. So you see, the Southcottites responded to that well because they accepted the notion of of Latter Day Revelation already. So thousands and thousands of of Southcottites joined the church. Because they liked the idea of living prophets, and they most of them came over to the United States on ships. And when these people came over and they settled in Nauvoo and, uh, and later in Salt Lake City, they told Mormons about this doctrine that that Negroes were the children of Cain and that there were fallen angels. So what happened then was was the Pratt brothers, Party P. Pratt and Orson Pratt, who were two apostles who went to England. Hey, let me stop you for one second. Okay. Something that's very <laughs> just interesting that um, my grandmother was a Pratt. <laughs> so I'm, I'm oh, related God. to the Pratts. It's really it's a, an interesting. I just wanted to, just to say that. So you, so you got some Pratt blood in you. Yep. <laughs> yep. Right? So yeah, Orson Pratt and Parley P. Pratt heard about this Curse of Cain doctrine This from the South Codites, from, the, from the, those... Southcottites who had had become Mormons told them about it, so they they basically ran with it, and but they changed it a little bit. They said, okay, yes, absolutely, Negroes are the are the, the children of Cain through Ham. Okay, that makes sense. And they said, but but they said, but no, we we don't we don't believe they're fallen angels. We think the fallen angels are demons, but. Um, Harley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, excuse me, wrote a paper in England called The Seer, which he said, he said, you know, he, he said it may, may be that the, the Negroes were not fallen angels at all, but they were spirits who followed Jesus in the war in heaven, but were less valiant than the other spirits who followed Jesus. Okay. You, you see, so he kind of took the Curse of Cain doctrine and he tweaked it a little bit. You yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. He tweaked it. So, and he published that in the Seer, which was a publication in Liverpool, England, for the the British mission of the of the Mormon Church. And so, um, and you know, and people in Utah also got copies of that, and that was distributed around. So that began to get popular. Now, of course, Joseph Smith was killed in 1844. In 1845, Brigham Young basically took control of the church. 
in Nauvoo, Illinois. Anti-Mormons were, were, were forcing, wanted the Mormons to leave Illinois. You know, they were, they were making threats. There, were, there was even military skirmishes in Nauvoo. Yes. With, with cannons and, you know, people getting hurt and killed and injured. So the Mormons agreed, okay, we're going to leave Illinois. We're going to the Great Basin, to the Great Salt Lake. We're going to leave all our homes here. We're going to leave everything. So the Mormons take off across the Mississippi when the river freezes over. And uh, they go on their great trek. So they stop in a place called Winter's Quarter, um, Iowa, Iowa Territory. No, I'm sorry, Nebraska, which was Indian, unorganized Indian Territory at that time. Now, Winter Quarters later, later becomes the city of Omaha, Nebraska. Okay. So they settled there and, and, and they said, we're going to stay here for the winter because it's too dangerous to cross the plains up into the mountains in the wintertime. You have to do it in spring and summer. You have to start out in the early spring and you'll make it by before the next winter. So a lot of Mormons started gathering in Winter's Quarter, Nebraska, later named Omaha, you know, to wait for the spring so they can start out across when the grass grasses come back so they can start out across the plains for, for uh, Salt Lake Valley. This right. is in 1847. Remember, at this time, more black more black Mormons are e- absolutely equal to every other Mormon in the church in all respects. Okay. They could become elders. Black men could become elders and whatever. And full equality. So anyway, at this time, you know, the frat brothers are teaching other Mormons about this new curse of Cain doctrine that Negroes are, you know, less valiant in the war in heaven. Yeah. And when 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 Jesus and his angels fought fought Lucifer and his angels, and Lucifer and his angels were cast out. Well, the Pratt brothers said, "Well, it's true that Negroes are the children of Cain, and the mark of it, Cain is a black skin." But you know they're not. They didn't follow Lucifer. They followed Jesus. That's why they were born as humans. They followed Jesus, but they were less valiant. What does less valiant mean? Um, maybe not lazier, like a lazy soldier. Maybe. Right. Maybe a little cowardly soldier. You know, you're fighting on our side, but you're not valiant in in the battle. So anyway, that that was their spin on it. And so Brigham Young gave a, a talk regarding that in 1847, which was recorded. And he says, he based, I'll paraphrase him. He says, you know, God, no, you know, the God has made of one blood every nation on the earth. And uh, he said, we have one of the best elders we have in the entire church lives in Lowell, Massachusetts, and he's an African. So he, Graham Young rejected the Curse of Cain doctrine in 1847. Oh, okay. He, pre- he preached it was not true in 1847. And because in Lowell, Lowell, Massachusetts, there was a black Mormon named uh, Walker Lewis, who was an elder in the church. And Lowell is uh, uh, in Massachusetts, and he was a Mormon elder. And, and, uh, in Boston, Massachusetts, at the time, there was another black man, my name Joseph Ball. He was the he was the st- branch president of Boston. Oh wow! Yeah. So Brigham Young, this is 1847. Brigham Young rejected the Curse of Cain doctrine taught by by the Pratt brothers and by Orson Hyde, another Mormon apostle. He re- he said no, no. I say he says the best elder we had in the church is Walker Lewis, and he's black. That's what he said. However, only five months later, something happened that made him do a complete 180 and change his mind. You know what that was? What was that? I'm curious. (laughs) (laughs) Well, all right. Well, in in Winter's Quarters, there was a black Mormon, he was a half black, half white Mormon elder by, uh, and by the name of William McCary. He, he was a little off mentally. 
he claimed to be a uh, related to some Indian chief or something, which he wasn't. He started telling Mormon women, white Mormon women, secretly, that he was Adam reincarnated. And he would approach a Mormon woman or girl, sometimes very young girls, and he would say, I'm Adam, I'm a prophet, and I am Adam reincarnated. And he said, and you are Eve reincarnated. Really? Yeah, yeah. And he would tell these girls and that that they're, they're, the sin of the Garden of Eden was God told them to, to multiply, and they ate fruit instead. Okay. In other words, God, God told them to have sex, but they defied God by eating fruit instead. So in order, he, he would tell these girls this, they would have, he was there and they were there to, to, to get rid of that original sin by, guess what? By having sex? <laughs> by having sex, yes. Okay. Yeah. So he told probably at least a dozen Mormon women and girls, that, he probably told two or three dozen this story. He was Adam, they were Eve, they would have to obey God's command by by multiplying, by with, by having with, sexual carnal knowledge with him, right? With, yeah, the, with him. Okay. Since he was, well, he was Adam, you see, and they were Eve. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now listen to this: about a dozen Mormon women and girls, all of them white, believed him. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, and they had sex with him, and so so he formed his own little group secret group of of polygamous wives and remember that at that time 1848 by this time uh mormon leaders were were secretly practicing polygamy yeah so and so he would go to these girls and said you know i am i'm adam reincarnated and the lord you're eve and he wants us to to fulfill his commandment to multiply and about a dozen Mormon women and girls. All right, so that sounds logical. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So they, they obeyed the Lord. Okay. When Brave Young found this out, he was livid. Of course. <laughs> he was enraged. He was enraged. Because I think what happened, Zach, was some of, the, some of these women and girls were his secret wives in the first place okay I think that's that's what anyway he was enraged he did a full 180 and he started preaching the curse of Cain doctrine okay that Negroes Negroes were spirits in the war in heaven who were less who followed Jesus in the war against Lucifer but were less valiant in the war as punishment they were born through the seed of Cain so in, a, in other words, Cain was a white man like Adam and Eve. He he killed Abel. Okay, he killed Abel as punishment. The Lord turned him into the first Negro. Poof. So Cain went and he married his sister, since there were no other humans besides his sisters to marry. He married his sister, who was Anglo-Saxon-looking white girl. The Lord said, "Oh, okay." Poof. Boom. She became the second Negro. That's the origin of the Negro race. Okay. Right. So the so the Canaanites continued. The seed of Cain were the Negroes. Now Noah comes along, and the the white people, the Sethites, children of Seth, are starting to to intermarry with these the the, the black women, and having mulatto children. So the Lord said, well, we got to cut this out. So I'm going to send a flood and kill all, all these people because they're intermingling. They're marrying, they're having children together. The seed of Cain with the seed of Seth. But so, so Noah, because you're a Sethite, because you're white and, and, and you never married a king, seed of Cain, a, a black woman, I'm going to save you and your wife and your, and your, your three sons and their wives. So Noah says, great, and he builds an ark, but here comes Ham. Ham marries a black woman who's a Canaanite woman. 
seed of Cain. Uh-huh. And she's pregnant, already pregnant, when he marries her with a full Negro child. So Noah doesn't like it, but all right, he's gone. This is his son. He's not going to leave his son and his son's wife behind. So he takes his son and even the Canaanite wife, even though he wasn't supposed to do that. Then on aboard the ark, Noah gets drunk on wine. He falls asleep. Naked. Ham comes in and uh, sees his father naked, drunk on the floor. Uh, then he calls, goes, tells his brother, hey, come see your naked dad who's drunk on the floor. The other two brothers, Shem and Japheth, go in and, and cover him up really fast and say to Ham, hey, you've, you've insulted our father by, by doing what you did. And so Noah wakes up and goes, oh, well, what's going on? And they tell him, yeah, Ham, you know, saw you naked. Instead of covering you up, he came and told us to come look at you naked. And Noah says, well, curse be Cain and a servant of servants unto his brethren, you know. Yeah. So basically, basically um, Noah puts a curse not on Ham, but upon Canaan, who's the full Negro child of Egyptus, Egyptus who is Ham's full Negro wife. Are you following along for pr- pretty much? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So that's how the that's how the Negro race, the Canaanite race, survived the flood. Okay. And so Brim Young taught this in General Conference. Okay. Uh-huh. It was taught General Conference by the Living Prophet at the time. It was taught by Orson Pratt, Parley P. Pratt, Orson Hyde, other apostles. It was taught by Mormon prophets and apostles and 70s, which are as, as a rank lower than apostles. Yeah, it was taught by bishops. It was taught by Sunday school, you know, teachers. It was taught, taught by seminary teachers and institute teachers all the way up through, uh, up until about the late 1960s. Okay. So this was the Kirsten Kane doctrine. Uh, Brian Young taught that... Yes, some spirits were less valiant in the war in heaven. As punishment, they are born into the seed of Cain, which is black because Cain killed his brother Abel. And so the Lord's Lord's would put the bar upon Cain, which is a black skin, flat nose, and kinky, kinky hair. Because Noah cursed Canaan, and since all Negroes are the descendants of Canaan, then all Negroes have to be the servants of of white men until the curse is removed when when will the curse be removed Brigham Young said that Abel will have to be resurrected and have children and then their children would have children and all the descendants of Abel will have to be offered the priesthood first then when the last descendant of, of Abel who was killed by Cain is offered the priesthood whether he accepts, accepts it or not that's up to him then after that, then will the curse will be removed, and the seed of Cain will be allowed to hold the priesthood. Okay. And so, and so Abel would have to be resurrected. Abel won't be resurrected until the resurrection of the just, which is at the beginning of the millennium. Now, all of Abel's children will have to have the priest offer have the priesthood first. So obviously, Abel Abel the son of Adam and Eve, will be resurrected at the beginning of the millennium. He'll have children during the millennium for a thousand years. Okay? So so the, the first Negro cannot be given the priesthood until what? After the millennium is over, right? Right. Right, because because Abel will continue to have, will have children and descendants all throughout the millennium. That, that's what Brigham Young taught. That was called the Curse of Cain Doctrine. That was a doctrine of the church for 130 years. The church taught it. Mormon apostles and prophets taught it openly in general conference. It was taught in church magazines. Uh, Mormon leaders, such apostles and presidents, such as Joseph F. Smith, Joseph Fielding Smith, wrote books about it, such as the book uh, uh, The Perfection of Man, uh, other books, The Origin of Man, The Perfection of Man. By Joseph Fielding Smith. This was this was taught in church magazines, the Improvement Era, Desert Evening News, General Conference reports, 
journal discourses published all, all these are published by the church it was official this was a doctrine of the church uh, for 130 years that's why uh, also, also in 1848 Brim Young said the Negro cannot worship in the temple in our temples he cannot have the priesthood because he's a he's a he's a descendant of a king. Mormons can't can't receive the ordinances of the temple. So all Mormon all black Mormons were banned from 1848 to 1978. Okay. And that was called the priest the ban was called the priesthood ban. Actually, it was a priesthood and temple ban for all black Mormons. Okay. Now at can you imagine how black Mormons felt in 1848 when all this comes down on their heads? First, up until then, they were equals in the Mormon church, and now they, they're they hearing this stuff in general conference? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure the ones who were prominent were devastated, and I'm sure a lot of them just wanted to uh, get, d- turn away from the church. I mean, why wouldn't you, you know? Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, this is what happened. Uh, most, most of the black Mormons at that time just left the church and uh, at one, one black Mormon family that left the church their last name was Mason and they had a son named Charles Mason who, uh, who later started the Church of Christ and God that became the largest black Pentecostal church in the world which now has I think about 12 or 13 million members but a lot of more a lot of most of the black Mormons basically left the church at that point. Okay. When Brigham Young started the priesthood ban, priesthood and temple ban, and uh, banned them from the temples, banned black men from the priesthood, and started teaching that blacks, you know, needed to serve the white man. Right. And you, and you know why all this came about, Zach? And why? Because of what that half black, half white oh, oh, Mormon yeah. elder did okay. in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> we said he was Adam reincarnated. Remember that story? Right. William McCary. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the origin of all this. Okay. So Yeah. So the so black people were banned from the Mormon temples and priesthood for one hundred and thirty years. Did did yeah. the Mor- did the Mormon leaders at that time explain the reasons why they were banning blacks during that time period or the, did they all, just yes all throughout this time period from 1848 to 1978 mormon church leaders were spoke with one voice they all said the same thing okay we are we they all said we are banning the negro because they were less valiant in the war in heaven and as punishment they were to spend mortality on earth without the priest the blessings of the priesthood or the temple ordinances and 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 they were to be born into the lineage of Cain and the mark of Cain was a black skin flat nose and kinky hair right every mormon leader from Graham Young in 1848 to Spencer W Kimball in 1978 that's 130 years say it said the exact same thing and they all call this a doctrine of the church. This was taught in general conference. In 1847, um, in 1847, the First Presidency released a statement signed by all three members of the First Presidency, which was called um, the First Presidency Statement. It was called, excuse me, Statement of the First Presidency on the Negro Question. Okay. Remember, Statement of the First Presidency on the Negro Question. That was released in August 1949. And in that statement, you can find a copy of that statement on the internet. In that statement, they say that, that you know, some spirits were less valiant in, in the war in heaven and, and were, were punished because they were less valiant, were punished by being born into the lineage or seed of Cain. Okay, you know that that the Negro can enjoy the blessings of baptism and confirmation, and he can take the sacrament, 
but he can't have any office of the priesthood, not even Aaronic priesthood, which more Mormon boys hold, right? Teenagers. No yeah. problem. Couldn't even do that. Can't, couldn't even be a deacon in, in, in the Mormon church. They can be members of the Mormon church if they want to, but they couldn't be, even be a deacon. They couldn't enter enter a Mormon temple. Okay. Until the curse was removed, which the church said would be sometime after the millennium was over. And Brigham Young also said this, if anyone, if, if anyone, if the church ordains the seed of Cain before the millennium was over, amen to the priesthood. God would take the priesthood from the earth and that would be the end of the, end of the church because the church would have no authority to do anything after that point. That's what Brigham Young said. Okay. So I was just I'm curious, do you know of any personal testimony from blacks who are members of the church during that time period or are there any places we can go to find such testimonies like uh, the I can't remember the name of the man you said who was claiming to be Adam, but after that I'm, I'm talking about um, blacks in the Mormon church who stayed and had any sort of testimony about that revelation. Yeah, okay. You will actually find, you know, what happened after 1848 when Brigham Young introduced the the Curse of Cain doctrine as an official doctrine of the church. Remember, it was taught before by the Pratt brothers as an unofficial doctrine. Yeah. Now, now it becomes official. As soon as the president of the church, as soon as the living prophet preaches something in general conference, right, that becomes official doctrine, correct? Yeah. Yeah. If, if the president of the church... What he says, he says, this is the way it is, and he preaches something in general conference. If that's not official, you know, what is? You know right. what I'm saying? Right. So, so Brigham Young makes it official in 1848. Most of the black Mormons uh, leave the church at that point, and I don't blame them. Uh, a, some, a few black Mormons remain in the church. For, exa for example, Elijah Abel's. Who's who's uh, I think half black. His wife, their children remain. Okay. His grandson remains. Uh, a, uh, uh, a few, some other. I, I, I would say a small handful of blacks remain faithful to the church. I would say no more than, gosh, maybe six or seven families. Okay. Remain faithful to the church. Now, over the decades, their grandchildren, you know, fall away from the church. Naturally, they're raised in the church, but, you know, they can't even go to a deacon's quorum meeting. You know what I'm saying? Right. They can't go to the temple. They can't go on a mission. They can't, you know, all these, all their white friends are doing, going on, you know, they can't become a scout leader in the church, for goodness sake. Because you have to have a, a priesthood office to do that, you, you know, to even to be a, a you know, a, in the Boy Scouts. I mean, it, it was crazy. You know, during priesthood meeting, the, the the black the black members of the black men and boys are told, "Go away in the foyer." Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine them sitting in the foyer during priesthood? Oh man. I'd... You know, twiddling, twiddling their thumbs until priesthood is over Ex because yeah. they can't even stay in, in a in a meeting. Exactly. I mean, I, I mean, so naturally, yeah, the great uh, most of these are six or seven families who are, remain faithful. Eventually, by the sec, you know, by the their grandchildren, just about all fell away. Right? Okay. And yeah, Mormon missionaries were told, you know, what. If, if take the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, they, oh, but not the black people. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. They, they were told, this is what they were told before 1978. They said, if a black person approaches you, says, I want to be taught, okay, teach them then, but don't approach them. You know, if, if you knock on the door and a black person is answering, answers it, you know, tell them, uh, oh, I'm sorry, we have the wrong house. Really? Sorry. Um, yeah. 
This is what they were told. <laughs> this is what they were told. And so, um, until 1978. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Uh, it, you know, basically, a, for a black person to join the church between 1848 and 1978, a 130 year period, uh, they would have to basically beg the missionaries to baptize them. Wow. Pretty much, yeah. And strangely enough, Zach, that happened. Church probably uh, ten to twenty times a year. Really? Yes. Now, uh, why these 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 black people uh, joined a church that uh, you know prevented them from the priesthood and the temple and and you know made them wait in the foyer during priesthood meeting? Um, is beyond me, honestly, but that did happen. Now, in half of these cases, what you had was it, you'd have a Mormon woman, often a Polynesian woman or a Hispanic woman, not of the white race, who would marry a black man. And if that happened, church leaders did not excommunicate the, the woman. Okay. That was acceptable. That was acceptable because she wasn't white. But if a white woman even dated a black man, she was excommunicated and shunned by her family and all her Mormon friends. But if she was if she was Hispanic or some other race but white, and she dated and married a black man, that was okay in the church. Huh. Yeah. So so most of the con black converts of the church during this 130 period were black men who who married Polynesian women like from Tonga or or Fiji or, or uh, you know or some other place like that or or they married his Hispanic women who, who were or Indian women Native American women yeah, yeah. The, the church the, the church leaders winked at that they winked at it they didn't they didn't they didn't give the man the priesthood and they refused to give the priesthood to, to their children of that of of that man and that woman, the children, the males couldn't have the priesthood, but they didn't excommunicate the woman. But if but if a white woman even looked at a black man, she was in a church court the next day. Wow! The next, the next Sunday, and she was excommunicated. Even dating, going on one date for a white Mormon woman to go on one date with a black man was was automatic excommunication. Huh. So, so yeah, there there was a f- very few number of you know you you could count them on 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 two hands and have a few fingers left over. There was a very few number of faithful black Latter Day Saints who knew about the the Cain doctrine, who knew about uh, the priesthood and temple ban, who knew they'd have to wait in the foyer during priesthood meeting if they were a male and stayed faithful to the church or joined the church anyway during this time period but their numbers were very few no okay. more than I would say before 1978 the church had no more than a few hundred uh, black African members at any time and most of them were inactive I would say probably no more than a dozen active in the entire world at any given time Okay, so and most of them were married to Polynesian or, or Hispanic or Native American women who were Mormons. Okay, so now in in June of 1978, the Mormon Church lifted the priesthood and temple ban and allowed blacks into the priesthood and temple. Can you tell me what motivated church leaders to do this? That's right. Pastor right. W. Kimball did that. Announced on June 8th, 1978. That the the that the uh, the policy of, was lifted, um, and that that's uh, found in uh, that was called official de- declaration too. Others call that by its nickname called the 1978 revelation. So, Richard W. Kimball, okay, he was uh, from uh, Arizona. He became an apostle in 1948. He became president of the LDS Church in 1975. Now, this is what happened, Zach. In, in the late 1960s, of course, you, 
there was this American Civil Rights Movement where blacks were trying to get equal rights with with whites, equal voting rights. You know, uh, at before before there. Before the late 1960s, uh, in the South, blacks had to sit in the back of the bus. When a white person came along, a black person had to give up their seat for the white person. Okay. Uh, even if the, the black, even if the black person was an old black lady, you know, if, if a black teenager, a white teenager came on the bus, she, she required to get up and give the seat to the white teenager. Yeah. Blacks uh, were often technically had the right to vote in the South, but were often denied the right to vote in the South because of trickery, because uh, they were asked very complicated questions at the voting booth, and if they didn't get the answer right, just right, they were denied the right to vote. Also, blacks were discriminated to in a lot of areas of American society as far as jobs, schools, universities they couldn't get into there's a lot of segregation still uh, and black schools were given a lot less money so they were, they were inferior and blacks couldn't go to white schools in many, most parts of the country many states uh, if you were black you could not legally marry a white person and that's including in the city of Utah right. a, lot of, a lot of discrimination housing, jobs, education etc etc politics so the blacks started a civil rights movement uh well uh dr martin luther king was prominent in that movement he was assassinated in 1968 so uh white liberals got on board with the civil rights movement uh, a lot of like white liberals were journalists in 1960 19, 1971 time magazine did did a story about the bl- the black Mormons of Nigeria. Now there weren't any Mormons in Nigeria. However, what happened was is that uh, Nigerians at that time, before 1965, Nigeria was still part of the British Empire, and so a lot of Nigerians were going to England to go, uh, to, go to school. And in England, some of these Nigerians would find out, would be given pamphlets by others or find copies of the Book of Mormon or various Mormon pamphlets. And they would be just not from talking to the missionaries, but just from reading these copies, you know, they found on the Book of Mormon or these pamphlets they would find, they would get a testimony that Joseph Smith was a prophet. So they'd go back home to Nigeria and they would tell others about Joseph Smith in the Book of Mormon. I'm not kidding you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so the other other black Nigerians would hear this, and some of these, and, and some guy, a Nigerian would jump up and grab that copy of the Book of Mormon, read it, get a testimony that it was, it was true, and then he would go out and start preaching about the Book of Mormon. And then he people would gather around and he'd start baptizing people you know because the book of mormon shows you what to do to baptize people yeah 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 and so and then they'd form a church <laughs> and they, they called the the mormon church of nigeria yes wow uh, to- totally without the knowledge of mormon leaders in salt lake city wow this is spontaneous <laughs> And by 1960, by 1971, there was 14,000 members of the Mormon Church of Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. And there was also another 10,000 members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Incorporated of Ghana, which was created in the same way, basically. Huh. And so these... You know, they would see they had some really old, raggedy copies of the Book of Mormon that they got from England. That's all, you know, one congregation would have one book, copy of the book, you know, and <laughs> yeah. it was it published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Salt Lake City, Utah. So these ministers, you know, would, would these ministers of these Book of Mormon churches would write to 
you know, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt City, Utah, and throw it in the mail. And then, you know, it would get to Salt Lake City, it would get to the desk of the first city, and it said, you know, from Emmanuel Uma, Uma Gumba, from Port Hart, Nigeria, to the Mormon leaders, you know, we would, we need more copies of the Book of Mormon, so could you please send them over? Yeah. <laughs> They're going, what's this? <laughs> where, yeah. where did this come from? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And so there... The church would spend a few years saying, who are you? What are you? Why did you contact us? And, and eventually they, the church sent emissaries to Africa, and the emissaries would come back and said, there's thousands of Book of Mormon believing people in Africa. We don't know where they came from. <laughs> but they're there. And they got leaders, and they got churches, and, and, and they want more copies of the Book of Mormon. What do we do with them? Yeah. So the church started talking, gosh, what do we do with these people? And so the church had a plan that they would send over retired men, white men, of course, to, to kind of like on missions, to be like missionaries. But they would be they would do all the all the baptizing and the, and the sacrament work, right, for these churches. The, but the black preachers would continue to preach, but. All the all the priesthood would be administered through these these temporary uh, senior retired white men elders from Salt Lake City. You understand? Yeah. Okay. So that was the plan, and so they planned to do that. They they weren't going to give any any of the black men the priesthood. I don't think they were going to even mention the priesthood to these people. Yeah. They were just. You know, they were just going to go over and say, "We're from Salt Lake City. We're going to give. The, we're going to pass out the sacrament ourselves, because you know, and this is the way it's going to be. If you want copies of the Book of Mormon, if you want us to help you out financially, because your 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 church here looks pretty decrepit, and you know there's no roof on it, we'll put a roof on your church. We'll put you know we'll give you copies of the Book of Mormon, as many copies as you want, but let us do." Our thing here, all right. So that's that was their plan. Well, at that point, things went awry because the Nigerian government found out that the church taught that Negroes are cursed. And a Nigerian student in California at Cal State San Luis Obispo found this out that that blacks think Mormons are cursed, and so he went back to Nigeria and he. he Uncle had a newspaper, and he wrote a big article for the newspaper called "Evil Saints: How the Mormon Church Thinks Black People's a Curse." Well, can you, can you imagine what that happened? The Nigerian government said, "You're not coming." It revoked all the visas for Mormons and said, "You're not coming into, into our country again." Right. Unless, of course, you pay us uh, five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah, yeah they wanted a bribe. That's and crazy. So the, yeah. So the church agreed to the bribe. They got it lowered, and they agreed to the bribe. It was, the church sent like a hundred thousand pounds to uh, to a London bank, and that someone from the embassy of Nigeria was going to pick up the money. However, right then. The Nigerian Civil War occurred and threw everything into a big mess. They canceled everything. But anything, this whole fiasco of what happened came to the attention of Time Magazine in 1970 or 71, I can't remember. Time Magazine did an article called The Black Saints of Nigeria. And in the article, they mentioned that, well, the church, you know, tried to get into Nigeria, but uh, they couldn't get in there because of, of its teachings regarding Negroes are, are cursed children of Cain and can't hold the priesthood nor enter the Mormon temple. And that was printed in Time Magazine. And at the time, Time Magazine had like a million subscribers, right? Yeah. It was really big. So, and all, all every single journalist in the country at that time Every single magazine and journal, newspaper journalist read Time Magazine. So they read this. Remember, this is at the height 
of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. And so at that point, there was an explosion of anti-Mormon uh, articles in magazines and, and newspapers. And, and this all began because of this, this article in Time magazine. And so all these liberals and the, uh, the black radicals like the Black Panthers were started to threaten Mormon missionaries and the Black Panthers said we're going to go to Salt Lake City and kill a whole bunch of Mormons you know because the Mormons are so racist and evil yeah and uh, this scared a lot of people in Utah at the time of course they were just blowing smoke but you know the white Mormons in Utah didn't know that right they were scared and so um the church was on the run at this point. At this point, Stanford University and a lot of other universities in the Western U.S. refused to play BRU in sports because BRU was now "quote unquote" a racist university huh. because it was a because it was a Mormon use of university. And so, so uh, you know, BRU would go play some other. And, you know, and you know they get threats and things thrown from the stands at them because they were racist. The missionaries were getting threatened on the street because they were racist. Another thing was happening. In 1975, the church was planning to build a temple in Sao Paulo, Brazil, which is the largest city in Brazil. Now, what the church didn't know at, the, at this time was that 80% of Brazilians, even white Brazilians, 80% of white Brazilians have Negro blood in them. Right. Okay, 80%. Because Brazilians used to have a lot of slaves, many more slaves than, than the United States had. And so 80% of white people in Brazil have Negro blood in them. They have Negro ancestors. And uh, the church in Salt Lake City did not know that at the time. Okay. So, all right. So the church in 1975 was building this temple, and so what? What do Mormons do? They they do works for the dead in the temple, right? For yeah. their dead ancestors. Yeah. And so Mormons in Brazil, for the first time, were saying, "Oh, we're going to have a temple. Great. We're going to do work for our ancestors. Let's do our genealogy work." So they do their genealogy work, and they go back a couple of generations, and they find out. Guess what? They find out. Right. Grandma was black. Yeah. Grand yeah. Or, or grandpa was black. Or great grandpa was, was black. Or great grandma was black. Right. Okay. They are now ineligible to go to the temple because they are, the, are, are, they are of the seed of Cain. Yep. So 80, the church finds out to its, to its absolute horror that 80% of white Mormon Brazilians are part black <laughs> and they can't go to the temple. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah. Yeah. So, so this is 19, 1975, 1976 when all they're finding all this out. So the church had two choices here. Okay. They could tell 80% of the Mormons in Brazil, sorry, you can't, go to the temple now even though you've you've sacrificed you've paid out money to the temple you expect to go to the temple you want to bless your you want to be sealed to your children and your wives and your husbands you want to do work for the your dead ancestors sorry you can't do it because well because you have the seed of cain in you and your that blood is cursed the, okay that's option a can you imagine what the what would happen under option a that, that no. <laughs> means 80 percent of the church in Brazil would be wiped out right right at least 80 percent or they could do option B they could get rid of the, the get rid of the priesthood ban now but if they got rid of the priesthood ban they would also have to not just Except white Brazilians with black blood, they would have to ex accept all seed of king. That means full-blooded Negroes, right? Full-blooded blacks, black Africans. So it was either option A, destroy the church in Brazil, or option B, get rid of the priesthood ban policy. 
That was that was the only choice Spencer De- President Spencer W. Kimball had. Now here's another thing, and, and I'm going to put these in big, bold, rumor box. This, what I just told you is fact. Now I want to tell you a rumor that I've heard that I do not know that if it's true or not. There is a rumor that the Justice Department under Jimmy Carter told the church in 1977 in, or told the church in early 1978 secretly okay unless unless you get rid of this priesthood ban uh, we are going to get rid of the church's tax exempt status right have you ever heard of that before yes I have okay now I've written to all sorts of people, including Jimmy Carter, who was president of the church, uh, president of the United States at that time. Is this the truth? Did this happen? Okay. Never got a reply from anybody. No reply. No yes, no no, no nothing. Okay. So I don't know if that really happened. Now, now a man named Rex Lee who used to be Solicitor General of the United States and used to be president of Brigham Young University, once said in a speech that he he once represented uh, the government. He he was, as Solicitor General, he was asked to, to basically threaten the church with, to withdraw its taxes at status. He said, since he was a Mormon, he had to recruit Recruse himself, I think it's called. Recuse. Yeah. He had to say, step down. I, I can't do this because I'm a Mormon. You know, one of my assistants is going to have to do this. I can't represent the government against my own church. Right. So, okay. So, so, so we know for a, because he said that, we know for a fact at one time, at one point, the U.S. government was threatening the the church's tax status. Now, Rex Lee didn't say why the, the government was doing that. But but the rumor is the reason why was because of the priesthood ban. In other words, the federal government said to the church, what you're doing is discriminatory and no organization that discriminates against blacks or other minorities can with can be tax exempt. Okay, so if that was true, then President Kimball had another choice. Option A, keep the priesthood ban and lose tax exemption. That means after that point, all the tithing can be taxed. Yeah. And all the church, not on all the nonprofit church businesses and lands and temples could also be taxed. That, that means the church would have lost billions upon billions of dollars each and every year. You understand? Right, yeah. Yeah, if that, if that happened. That was option A. Or option B, he could get rid of the priesthood ban and all that would go away. So, so those are the, the three main pressures. Uh, BYU athletes, BYU is being pressured. His athletic department was being pressured. The Mormon missionaries were being pressured because because they were being threatened. Uh, Utah, it's Salt Lake City, was being threatened by the Black Panthers and others. The church was uh, getting a lot of bad press. Uh, the church in Brazil w- was facing uh, destruction. And this is rumor. This last part is all that is fact. This, this last part is rumor. Rumor. And rumor, the federal government was threatening the church's taxes and status. So option A, Spencer W. Campbell could, could say, "I don't care." Brad Young said that, that 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 this that this ban will will stay in place until the end of the millennium. I don't care. We're going to ride out the storm until the end of the millennium. Option A. Option B, get rid of the ban. All those problems go away. Guess what? President Sessions W. Kimball decided to do what? Option B. Yeah. <laughs> get, rid, get rid of the priesthood, priesthood brand. Bam. All those problems went away. So on June 8th, 1978, 
President Campbell announces that the Lord has lifted the priesthood ban and all those problems that the church was facing went away in one day. And since 1978, blacks have had full equality in the Mormon church. And they really have. Have they been accepted? By the younger generations, yes. By the older Mormons over the age of 60 or 70, not so much. But by the Mormons under 50, under under 55, I, I would say yes, blacks have been ex- fully accepted in, into the church now. Okay. So, um, Derek, so what... That, that is the reason why, why for the 1978 revelation. Okay. Go ahead. I, and I was just wondering, do you think another reason for the, the the lift of the ban was because blacks were becoming more prominent and a more prominent and accepted part of society than they were in pre- previous times? Um, or is that maybe just off to the, like a side issue? I don't know. You probably explained that a little bit, but... Well, I think one thing that is being said today by what young Mormons are hearing today is that um, the reason why blacks were banned from the priesthood is because Mormons were too prejudiced. And, and in 1978, Mormons, white Mormons were much more accepting of blacks. And so that's why the, the church lifted the ban because the Mormons themselves were more presidents. I, I don't, I don't buy that. Okay. Because the church, the church had 130 years to, to make white Mormons more accepting of blacks, right? Yeah. Church leaders had 130 years to do that, to educate white Mormons, to make them accepting of blacks. The church leaders didn't do that. The church leaders did just the opposite of that for 130 years. Right. Okay. So what what about Mormons who claim that the, the curse of Cain doctrine was never a doctrine of the church, but simply just some folklore by some of the members and leaders of the church. Yeah, no, uh, no way. That's just, that's just an excuse. That's, that's a rewriting of history to say it was just folklore and never a doctrine. It was a doctrine. You could, you could, the church calls it a doctrine in, in, uh, the statement of the first presidency on the Negro question released in August, 1949 signed by all three members of the First Presidency. Uh, I mean, what doctrine means teaching. What Whatever the living prophet says in General Conference is doctrine. It's true. It's what the Church teaches. And this was taught by many Mormon leaders in General Conference for 130 years. You can't get more doctrinal than that. Right. So those, those who, are, who are saying, oh, no, it was never a doctrine. It was just folklore that, you know, some of the members believed well yeah maybe some of a few of the leaders too but no it was just speculation no that's that's bs that is bogus that's not the truth at all and uh you know that's not the truth and it i want to recommend a book here written by a couple of historians that will reveal the facts it's uh, uh, the name of the book is called the mormon church and blacks a documentary documentary history it's published by the University of Illinois Press the editors are Matthew L. Harris and uh, well just remember that name I don't want to confuse the listeners just remember uh, Matthew L. Harris H-A-R-R-I-S University of Illinois Press the Mormon Church and Blacks just go to www.amazon.com type in quote the Mormon Church and Blacks close quote and that book will come up it comes in paper hardback paperback in and Kindle ebook I highly recommend this book and what these two these two historians do Matthew L. Harris and Newell G. Uh, Bringhurst what they do is they just quote Mormon leaders and their and their official letters just year after year after year after year teaching the Christian Cain doctrine. Okay. They just quote Mormon leaders. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of pages of quotes. Huh. From Mormon, from Mormon leaders, from Mormon magazines, from Mormon letters of the first presidency. They just, you know, they, 
they write very little, these men. They just quote. This, this is a book of almost pure quotes from Mormon leaders over a 130-year period. So anyone who says, oh, this was never a doctrine, uh, oh, church leaders never taught this, maybe a few members did, oh, that is just, all that is crap. Right. Zach, it's just a big pile of crap. So if you want proof, get the book, The Mormon Church in Blacks, a documentary history. Just go to Amazon.com. Uh, you can, you can get a copy of that book, either ebook or, or a hardback or a paperback, and that's all the evidence is there. What can I say? All the evidence is there, and those who say it was just folklore are either lying or they're they're dupes, repeating a lie that they believe is the truth. Okay. Um. So in in 2013. The, the church released a statement online at LDS.org called the Race and Priesthood Statement, which disavows prior church teachings concerning blacks and disavows the belief that a black, the, that a black skin is a sign of God's curse of disfavor. Can you, can you comment on this, that statement? Yeah, December 2013, um, a statement was released on LDS.org called the Race and Priesthood Statement, which was approved by the First Presidency, was not signed by them. It was written by several Mormon scholars and historians. Um, the statement says that uh, that the priesthood ban came about because of the racism of Brigham Young and other early Mormon leaders. So it's honest there. However, it says that the, the you know this this is not not now a doctrine of the church. The statement doesn't doesn't tell people it was a doctrine of the church. It just says it's not now a doctrine, which okay. is technically true. Um, the statement says the church disavows the belief that a black skin is a sign of God's curse or disfavor. That's a direct direct quote from the statement. However, Zach, the Book of Mormon teaches that a that God cursed the Lamanites with a dark skin because they were idolatrous and filthy and, and idle. So that's what the and and that was. I mean, the this statement teaches the exact opposite of what the Book of Mormon teaches. Exactly. Yeah. So and it says it says that. Basically, it disavows the Curse of Cain doctrine, even though the statement doesn't explain what the Curse of Cain doctrine is. Right. So, you know, the church is trying to have it have its cake and eat, eat it too. It's it's saying, well, we disavow all theories inside or outside the church that say that says that one race is superior or or that a skin of blackness is a sign of a curse. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's fine. But again, that doesn't apologize for the curse of Cain doctrine. Right. That what that says is the Book of Mormon can't be true because that contradicts the Book of Mormon, which teaches that the Lamanites or or American Indians, the descendants of Laman, the son of son of Lehi, who was a Jew from Jerusalem. That the Lamanites were cursed with a skin of darkness because they were filthy and idle and worshipped pagan gods. And and the Lord did not want the Lamanites to intermarry with the white-skinned Nephites. So the, God cursed their skin with a skin of darkness. It says it right there in the Book of Mormon. Right. Every copy of the Book of Mormon has that. Yeah. Yeah, and... Um, this statement says the exact opposite that a dark skin is not a sign of God's curse or disfavor the race and priestess statement on LDS.org Zach that is a contradiction what yeah. the church has done is they've, they've thrown the book of Mormon under the bus <laughs> yeah they have they, they said don't believe in the book of Mormon believe in our, our statement on LDS.org now the, the really strange thing there is that 
this the church has issued a statement online but they never issued it they never mentioned this in general conference and they never mentioned anything about this in in the church magazine the ensign so most mormons don't know about this right so do you know why that is zach why is that can you guess I'm I'm guessing that most Mormons don't know about it because they they've been told not to ask questions. <laughs> uh, okay, well, this is why Zach, the church leaders know know that if older Mormons over the age of fifty Mormons over the age of fifty were taught as children the Curse of Cain doctrine in Sunday school and elsewhere. Okay. Okay, there. There. I, I know you're under fifty, Zach, but but believe me, Mormons over the age of fifty were, was taught this. This the curse of Cain doctrine was part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as much as any other part. It was as true as any other part of the doctrine of of uh, the church. Okay, you understand? Yeah. So it's not folklore. This the curse. Negroes being the cursed children of Cain, Mormons over the age of 50, 60 years old today were taught this growing up. They were taught this was the part of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. This was eternal truth, as much as part of the gospel as any other part. If these older Mormons who are still in the church, still paying tithing, acting as bishops, Relief Society presidents, what have you, if they heard that the church has disavowed the Curse of Cain doctrine, many of these older Mormons will leave the church. Right. Because they know this that this disavow is, is completely different from what they were taught growing up. Exactly, okay? yeah. Com- uh, absolute 180. So the church, Mormon leaders, do not want older Mormons knowing about this. So if they said, mentioned it in general conference, or if they published it in the church magazine, the ensign, all Mormons would know about it, wouldn't they? Yeah, definitely. In- including the Mormons over 50 years old. Right. So Mormon leaders don't want that. So they're 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 hiding it under a bu- under a, a, a bushel. Yeah, and they know only they know that older Mormons usually don't go online. Exactly, older, older Mormons above the age 50, 60 years old, they usually don't go to LDS.org. That is so true, <laughs> so true. But the younger Mormons do, don't they? Yes. So the younger Mormons read the church. The church disavows, uh, you know, any notion that black skin is is a curse or a sign of God's disfavor, they think, great, this is wonderful. I've always believed this. Yeah. And, but if the older Mormons found out about this, I, listen to me, I, I've talked, I've spoken to many Mormons about the, the race and priest, priestess statement, which is on, on LDS.org under, to, under topics. You can find it there still today. It's been there since 2013. I've talked to a lot of Mormons this is what younger Mormons tell me under the age of uh, 30. Oh, the church never taught that black people are cursed. But where did you get that? <laughs> yeah. No, that's a lie. No, no, the church would never, the church, the church would never teach anything like that. Are you crazy? Yeah. yeah. That's racist. No, why? <laughs> now, this, this is what Mormons over the age of 60 tell me when I tell them, oh, you're a liar. Oh, 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 you're a liar. <laughs> no, the church would never disavow the curse of gay doctrine. Are you kidding me? No. <laughs> yeah. So the older Mormons are calling me a liar when I tell them about the race and priesthood statement. And then the younger Mormons are calling me a liar when I tell them about the curse of Cain doctrine. You know what, Zach? I'm not lying. No, no. <laughs> I'm, tell- I'm, I'm telling both of them the absolute pure truth. And they just don't want to believe it. No. And if you're listening to me right now, if you're if you're a Mormon over sixty, and and you think we're lying here when we're telling you that the church has disavowed the Curse of Cain doctrine, declaring it false, 
We're not lying. Go to LDS.org, click Topics, find the Race and Priesthood Statement, read it for yourself. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll throw it up there on the images too so they can see it for themselves. Okay. If you're a Mormon under 30 and you're listening to this and you think we're lying and you about, about the church's Curse of Cain legacy and history, yeah, sorry, pal, we're not lying. We are not lying at all. We're telling you the truth. I mean, uh, some Mormon leaders have, have told horrible things about blacks. I mean, I'll give you two, two brief examples. Um, John Taylor, the third president of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said in general, taught in general conference once that Negroes are the representatives of Satan on earth. Wow. Yeah, Brim Young said uh, that if a white man mingles his seed with a with the seed of Cain, I mean, if has sex with a white with a black woman, and and a child is produced, that man is is to be killed on the spot. Yep. And and he and he added he added this, and I will add, I would also kill their children. He said, this is the law of God. This will always be so. He said that in general conference. When the <laughs> wow. living prophet speaks in general conference, that is the official doctrine of the church. Many, get this, Zach. Many, younger, many young Mormons today in seminary, which are M- Mormons who are in Utah and other places who are in junior high or high school, go to a Mormon class one hour a day, which is called seminary, you know, when they are told nothing about the curse of Cain legacy or doctrine. If, if nothing, it is it, the, the encyclopedia of Mormonism, which was published by the church in cooperation with some university. You know what you'll find, you, you know what you'll find, which is, I think, I don't know, 10 volumes, 12 volumes, thousands of pages, everything about Mormonism, Encyclopedia of Mormonism, right? Right. Do you know what you can find about the curse of Cain in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism? What? Nothing. Really? They don't mention it. <laughs> That's crazy. I wonder yeah. I wonder why not. <laughs> I wonder why not. Zach, they are covering it all up. They are they are burying the history of the curse of Cain. They're embarrassed by it. They are burying it. They are covering it all up. Yeah, I it's think a cover up. That's pretty obvious. They are, at this point. they are rewriting Mormon history. Now the church teaches people in Sunday school about church history, right? Right. And and in seminary and in institute classes, which are college classes for Mormons, called Institute of Religion classes. The church is public, publishes official uh, manuals that the, the teachers already use in these classes. <clears throat> How many of these manuals produced by the church for use in Sunday school, in priesthood meeting, in recently release society meeting, in seminary, in seminaries and institutes? How many of these official church manuals mention the curse of Cain doctrine? Yes. Um, I'm, I'll just take a random guess at uh, zero. <laughs> you got it. You win the prize. None. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. Do you think the church has something to hide, Zach? No. No. Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> of course they do. Yes, they have a lot to hide. Now, the church could be honest and come out with a statement and say, yes, our leaders taught for 130 years that black people were you know, the, the inferior cursed cursed children of Cain, less valiant in the word in heaven. Yes, Brim Young did authorize slavery in Utah, black slavery. Uh, yes, um, all this is what they taught is true. Brim Young did, did say that interracial couples and their children needed to be killed on the spot, yes. Yes, John Taylor did call Negroes the representatives of Satan on earth, yes. That was a mistake. Yes, we did ban blacks for 130 years. That was a mistake. They were wrong. We apologize. We fixed the problem. 
let's move on. If the church was honest about its history, they would do that. They're not doing that. Nope. It's been almost 40 years from 1978. The church has never done that. Do you Young Mormons are, are not being told anything. If the subject comes up, their seminary institute teachers tell them some bogus spin like, oh yes, the only reason why blacks were banned is because the, the members were were prejudiced, so the church leaders thought, well, let's not subject blacks to this prejudice, so let's wait till the members mature, then right. we'll... You know, right, blame it, on the, blame it on the members. <laughs> blame it on, always, always. The, the church leaders will always blame things on the members, never on themselves, do you think, or their predecessors. Do you, do you think it's... Uh stems from their whole belief of lying for the Lord, that it's the right thing to do, and that since it, since they believe it's the right thing to do, and so they won't so they don't lose members and lose support they're, they're lying with the Lord's permission of course, of course Mormon leaders have been lying for the Lord since you know, 1830 uh, lying for the Lord is what Mormon church leaders do when they feel they have to do something to protect the church or to protect the image of Joseph Smith and they justify lying for the Lord in that they are protecting the church and they're protecting the faith of the members right so so in order to protect the faith of the members because you know we're, the members are so weak and you know and we had to protect them <laughs> from doubt yeah you know they have to stretch the truth and tell lies and most of these lies are just lies of omission for example young Mormons growing up today are never told anything about the cursed king young Mormons under the age of 30 have called me a liar many times when I told them what the church used to teach they're told nothing yeah and again and again if they if, if the question comes up they're usually lied to right and so uh, yeah the the church leaders have a very long history of lying for it. And if you want to see more evidence of that, go to, go to, go to YouTube, type in Mormon church and lying for the Lord and find a lot more information on that. Okay. So Derek, if, if listeners want to know more about the curse of Cain doctrine, how can they get more information about it? That's very easy. We live in the information generation. Just go to Google, www.google. For those of you who don't know, you should know, www.google.com. Go to Google, type in, in the search box, type in the following, Mormon Curse of Cain Doctrine. Mormon Curse of Cain Doctrine. A lot of websites will come up. You could also do the same thing on YouTube, or you could also type in Mormon anti-black doctrines, Mormon anti-black doctrines. Again, on Google, on YouTube, or, or any search engine, really, and you'll get lots and lots of information with, with hundreds of quotes from early Mormon leaders, lots of information that way. I also recommend, if you really want to dig into this, to get the book, The Mormon Church and Blacks, edited by Martin L. Harris. That's Matthew. Isn't it Matthew? University of Illinois Press. What? Isn't it Matthew Harris? Yeah, did I just say that? No. Yeah, you said Martin. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Matthew L. Harris, The Mormon Church and Blacks, and you can just go to www.amazon.com, type in, quote, The Mormon Church and Blacks, close quote, Get that book in some form, either e uh, either as a Kindle book or as a soft cover, and all the information is there. Either Google, YouTube, Amazon.com, and get the book. All the information will be before your face. And um, what the church is doing by trying to cover up and rewrite its history is dishonest, it's immoral, and it's not of God. No true church needs lies and cover-ups to protect it or help it grow. Exactly. That is not of God. Exactly. 
Okay. And, um, finally, Derek, many Mormons who lose faith in Mormonism become atheists and agnostics, but you, you became a Daheshist. Can you briefly explain the reasons why you left the LDS church and became a Daheshist? Okay, like I say, I, 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 I explain why I left the LDS church because all the things that I found in my research. Remember, I, I, I wasn't researching in order to, to to write a book against the church. I was researching to write a book to defend the church. And unfortunately, I had to go where the facts led me and the, the facts led me out of the church. I, I did study a lot, a lot more religions. I, I, I've spent many years studying thousands and thousands of religions. Uh, most of these religions, Mormons have never ever heard of before. Yeah, I spent many years studying thousands of them. Uh, in nineteen, uh, excuse me, in two thousand five, I became a Deheshist. I became a follower of Doctor Dehesh, the, the miracle working prophet of Lebanon. He, he uh, was the greatest worker of supernatural miracles of all time. Um, many hundreds of people who are still alive today uh, will tell you of the miracles that they saw him perform. And if you want to read my story of, of why I left the church and became a Deheshist, uh, I have an online book, which is free, totally free, called Falling, in, Falling into the Sun. Why I left the Mormon Church and became a Deheshist, and uh, we're going to put the link up for that here at the end of this um, video. I uh, encourage everyone to read that online booklet. It's not that long. Uh, it's not as long as a, as a normal book. It's shorter than that. Uh, there are many accounts of the paranormal and super supernatural in that book that really truly. Uh, whether you agree with the book, conclusions of the book or not, it's not boring reading. I think you'll enjoy reading it. And that's that's at, uh, the head, at the, my website, Deheshism, D-A-H-E-S-H, Deheshism.webs, plural, dot com. Deheshism.webs, dot com. It's called Falling into the Sun. Deheshism.webs, dot com. So uh, go to Google. If you want to know about more about the Curse of Cain, go to Google, type in Mormon Curse of Cain Doctrine. Go to, go to the uh, YouTube search, search, search engine, type in Mormon Curse of Cain Doctrine. Get the, get the book, Amazon.com, The Mormon Church and Blacks. All the evidence is there, straight from the, the mouths and pens of Mormon leaders. If you want to read about my story, why why falling into the sun, why why I left the Mormon Church, and became a Deheshist, go to to uh, Deheshist Deheshist.webs.com. Thank you. Okay, so anyone who would like to read Derek's online booklet that he just explained, uh, titled "Falling into the Sun," can go to this website, which I'll also put up as an image file. Uh, which is at deheshism.webs.com. That's D A H E S H I S M dot webs dot com. Um, if you'd like to know more about the Mormon Curse of Cain doctrine, just as Derek explained, go to google.com, type in Mormon Curse of Cain doctrine or Mormon anti black doctrines, and you'll find many links to many websites that quote extensively from Mormon leaders themselves who taught this doctrine in general conferences and in their writings. Uh, we invite our, all of our listeners to leave their comments in the comment, in the comment area below. We'd love to read them. Uh, please look for our other YouTube videos, uh, Mormonism Exposed 101, Mormons and Sex, and uh, Mormon Secret Temple Rites Exposed. Search for those on YouTube under those titles. Uh, thank you all for listening. Good night and go in peace.